podcast with Victor Pacheco. We got a really great show for y'all. But before we hop in, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Long Beach Comedy, which takes place at Harvell's in downtown Long Beach, California, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, we have award-winning dancers, celebrity drop-ins. You never know who's going to be there, but I'll tell you who will be there. Me, your boy, Victor Pacheco, every single second and fourth Tuesday of the month with new material. So come and check me out. Come and check out the shows. Hope you enjoy it. Hello and welcome to Poppycock Podcast with your host, Victor Pacheco. We got a really special show today with a very special guest, a friend of mine, the recent winner of the San Francisco International Company Competition of 2022, uh, regular opener for Dave Chappelle. Why don't you give it up real big for my man, Mr. Chris Briggins. What's up, brother? Hey. Thank you. Thanks for coming through. Thanks for being here, man. How are you doing today, my man? I'm good. I'm good. I'm. Uh, I just finished eating breakfast, so I'm full now. I'm extremely good. Everything's good. It's a nice rainy day here in the Bay Area, so. <laughs> oh man, doing? no, that's great. I only heard the last part where it's a nice rainy day in the Bay Area, so that's hella oh. funny because I was like, I heard, I heard the punchline, but I didn't hear the fucking setup. No, now I can hear you perfectly. It's fine. Oh, wow. No, that's so funny. Oh, like, man, no, no, cool. No, no, no. It's, it's fine. No, we're, we're going to get through this. We're going to power through this, man. Uh, because, no, okay, Chris Riggins is a funny-ass dude, one of the humblest dudes that I know. This dude should be an asshole, how funny he is, but he is actually <laughs> one of the nicest guys I've ever met. And, like, I know you're not going to remember this, Chris, but Chris was, like, one of the first people that, like, put me up on a show without having to, like – bring people to the audience because he was hella cool like super cool there was like hella beef going on on facebook in this group called bay area comedy network and you put out some you put out a post saying i got a guest spot for somebody and i was just all like um dude i'm down to take it um and if you don't pick me i don't want no fucking facebook beef because there was all this facebook beef going on and like you're like fuck it you got it bro and i was i was at the legionnaire saloon in Oakland, and that was legit, man. And I don't know. I think Chris Riggins has a really unique story because Chris, I want oh, to wow. tell you. Remember people, that show? I remember that show. I remember that show distinctly. I was like, oh fuck, do I need to change it up because there's hella black people? And I'm like, fuck no, I don't need to change it up. I'm just gonna say what I'm gonna say. And you know, I was five months in, so it was not a. I didn't. I didn't have a great. I didn't have a great show. I didn't do a great show. Like, you know, I got a couple of chuckles, but then I was just like, oh, cool. I got to, got to see some professional comedy on a real shows. And I was just like, I can't believe you gave me a chance. But like, I legit used the word butt hurt and face and Facebook funk in the in the intro. But it's it's so crazy, though. But like, I, I, I want the people at home to know, Chris, when was the first time you performed stand up comedy? What, what, just, what, what, what were the circumstances under? Because this this is amazing. Like, I can't even this is un unbelievable. Um, the first time I did stand up, I opened up for Dave Chappelle uh, at the New Parish in Oakland. Um, it was on a challenge. It was a dare by two of his friends. Uh, one of his friends who actually happens to be the, the manager of singer D'Angelo. And the other guy is just like, you know, he's Dave's right hand man. So I was roasting them at another event and they challenged me to open up for Dave because they, they basically said, if you think you're so funny, get on stage. And so I did it. I was like, all right, let's go. And I mean, this time I was drinking. So there was a lot of liquid courage in the whole situation, but it worked out. It turned out that I was funny. So it worked out for the best. Chris Riggins, dude, that, that, okay. That story is too unbelievable. Like, okay, how are you in a position where you're hanging out with Dave Chappelle and his homies, and you're roasting his homies. It's like, you can't roast Dave Chappelle, so you can roast the homies. Well, he wasn't even there. Dave wasn't there that night, but it was an event that we were doing. Actually, you know who was there that night? Uh, Yasin Bay, AKA Mo Step. It was an event with Yasin Bay, and uh, we were doing a show with him for New Year's Eve, I believe. And then they challenged me to open up for Dave in two weeks. That's hilarious. Wait, how much prep time did you have between the challenge and the show? Was it like go up tonight type of thing, or was it like go up next week? Or I had two weeks. You had two um, weeks to, to, to train. 
but here's the thing i didn't take it seriously i thought whatever you're not going to really do this so i didn't i didn't do any training i didn't write nothing i just was living my my drunk life i didn't i didn't, I didn't even care and then, but like, you're just naturally funny you just naturally funny. Yeah. So how did it go? Did it was it a good experience? Like or was it like like like? Ah, it was. I put it like this: if I had if, if I had bombed that night, you probably wouldn't be talking to me right now. <laughs> I probably been like, ah, I'm never doing this again. I'm oh never God. doing this again. Oh my God! But yeah, I had I with two days before the event, they hit me up, and they were like, "You still doing this?" And I was like, "Doing what?" He was like, "You opened it up for Chappelle," <laughs> and I was like. Uh okay, yeah. What up? Let's do it. So I wrote like four jokes, had four really shaky jokes, and I ended up doing twenty minutes my first time. Like I, they just left me up there. Like literally, dude put me on stage. He he introduced me on stage, and left me. He went into he went back up to the green room to talk to Dave, and they was up there. And then I guess apparently he was like, let me go down and check on dude. And he came down, and I was doing pretty good. And then Dave got on stage and said, give it up for Chris. That's pretty hilarious. And then he asked me, was this my first time? I was like, yeah, it was my first time doing comedy. He was like, well, that's pretty good for your first time. Now, this is before Dave was back to drinking, so he had a great memory of it. But, yeah, uh, that's basically what happened. Was, and then I got asked back the next night to do another 20. And I ended up doing 20 again. That's hilarious because it's just like, uh, uh, when were you an open micer? Never, just pro comic from the first fucking from the gate. Yeah. It's like you, it's like you had twenty minutes without even knowing you had twenty minutes, and I'm like over here exactly. like, what's my next twenty minutes about? You're just like, oh, day two weeks, twenty minutes. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was, it's just, it was crazy. It was like it was, I think it was mostly adrenaline, uh, and also you know a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, it's like a brother. Uh, Namani, uh, Mobilani, Nobani, Namani, I can never say his last name right, but Namani is the, the brother of, of the singer Guapale. Um, and I've known both of them since I was a kid. Like, we went to elementary school together. So I've known Namani for my whole life, basically. And he saw me in the courtyard of the new parish pacing around, nervous, like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And he literally gave me the best advice ever. He looked me in my eye, he said, dude, what are you stressing about? Nobody came here to see you. So you have no expectation. So go up there and just do whatever. Because like, if you fail, people are still going to be like, oh, that's pretty dope that you got to open up for Dave Chappelle. And if you do great, then people will be like, oh my God, you killed it, opened up for Dave Chappelle. So that alleviated a lot of nerves. And I was able to go up there and do what I had to do. That's excellent advice. And I have a question, though. Now, okay, because Chris Riggins is a headliner. And so I want to know, how, how do you do that as a headliner, though? Like, what would be your advice for, for like, you know, trying to keep your spirits up for, 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 for a headliner during that type of situation? Uh, now it's different. It's a different self-talk. It's more or less the lines of you know what to do. You know, like, if you're a headliner, yeah, nerves are good. It's good to be a little nervous for you on show, but you have to remember, like, you know what you know how to do. This. this is what you do. So don't stress it like you don't know what you're doing. Just go up there and do what you know how to do. Um, and that's kind of the philosophy I took into the San Francisco International Comedy Competition. It's like, yes, we're competing, but you know how to do comedy. And so it's just a matter of getting up there and executing what you know how to do. You know, it's like any competition, any kind of sports, or anything you do. You know, uh, uh, you know, Tom Brady might still get nervous, but he goes out there because he knows what to do. He knows how to run a football, how to run an offense. So it's the same mentality. You know what you do. You know how you got here. You know what you've been through. So just go up there and do what you do best. Dude, that's awesome advice, man. I mean, and yeah, it's it's just sometimes, I don't know, people get up in their own heads about what, what what's going to happen or what's going on or like, I've literally seen white comics look around to see if there's any black people in the audience so they could use their little, you know, edgy right. jokes. And I'm just like, look, dude, if you don't have the balls to say in front of fucking black people, like, or in front of anybody, in front of fucking Mexicans, in front of fucking white people, yeah. you know, like, it's just like, don't say it. It's just yeah, like, geez. I don't know, like, like, I have a, like, that was one of the things I want to talk to you about because, like, uh, Chris Riggins is actually very, very 
socially conscious and culturally aware of what's going on in our society. And so you're able to bring in that perspective, like from your real life. And so like, I wanted to ask you, like, how do you feel about the black mermaid and the controversy going around it as a black man? Because I, I made a joke about it. How do you feel about Mexicans joking about the black little mermaid and making fun of black women in the, in the process? Because You know what I mean? Because, because it's well, not in bad taste. It's just like the punchline is just, you know, um, it's not, you know, all these white women are pissed off, but black women are the ones that should be pissed off because it's not even believable for black women to get her hair wet and still be in a good mood. Well, that's like, the thing. That, that's that's uh, the thing about culture and the way that we learn about culture is we often learn about culture directly around us. Um, the thing I know for a fact is there's a whole world of black women, not just black women in the United States. So like there are, there's a, there's a whole continent called Africa. It's full of black women and yeah. many of them live by the ocean. Many of them live by the sea. So it's not far fetched to believe that black women can swim because if you go like South Africa, there are black women surfers who, who, who face shark infested waters to surf just like the white girls here in Southern California. So I think what it is is when you don't know that the world is a lot bigger than what you see, then sometimes you kind of just focus on that because yeah, there are black women that don't get their hair wet. And that's a whole nother discussion of why, because, you know, black women's hair has been criminalized to an extent where, you know, black women can't even wear their hair naturally to work because it's deemed unprofessional. So they have to get these hairstyles that are not natural to their hair, which means when the water hits their hair, it's going to take them back to that, that natural state, which could affect their job. Um, and oftentimes, you know, beauty standards are based on the straighter the hair, the prettier the person, which is kind of based in a white supremacist view of the world, which says that your hair has to look like us in order to be considered beautiful, professional, or any of these things. So the joke in itself, talking about Black women not getting their hair wet, isn't inherently racist, because if the only Black women you know don't get their hair wet, then of course, you're going to make that joke. And it's not inaccurate. You know, a lot of black women are like, but at the same time, it is inaccurate because I grew up with black girls that went swimming. You know, I grew up with black girls that love water, that love to get their hair wet, you know, because there's all kinds of black women. So I think once you learn more about black women, you tend to change your that joke can change into more of a, a, a critique of how white America judges black women based on white beauty standards. Yeah, and I think that it's it's important to note that a lot of a lot of I mean, and, and it is like just the history of just like racism and systematic racism and the way that we're like the straighter the hair, the the the, what, the prettier the face. Is that what you said? Uh, no, no, the straighter the hair, the the more prox the closer to whiteness is considered beauty. You know, beauty standards around the world due to colonization have been based in in the white in whiteness so because white women are born naturally with straight hair not all of them some white women out there got some, some kink in their hair got some curl in their hair but yeah. the 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 i i guess i want to say the aryan standard of beauty is straight hair and so many other cultures have been forced to straighten their hair to fit into the societal uh, acceptance of 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 straight hair which is based in whiteness so it's not necessarily the prettier the face it's just straight hair is associated with beauty. So you can have an ugly face, but as long as your hair is straight, you're considered into the norm of beauty. That's profound because like with me, I'm just like, I don't know, there's, I'm around so many stuck up people in LA. Like, no, no, you have to have the straight hair and the pretty face. And it's just like, yeah. it's so fun. Like I've never been or like, it's, it's so shark infested in LA. Even like the audience is like, Oh, you're not beautiful or famous. Get the fuck off stage. Um, who the fuck yeah. are you? Why should I listen to you? Or, or you know, it's, it's so right. fucked up. And then it's like, it's like, unless you're like a skinny, pretty, I hate to say it, but white person, like, you know, it's like, I mean, I hate to say it, a lot of the lineups are mostly just like just white, white, like everywhere. Yeah. Unless it's Latino white. night or it's urban night or, you know, it's, uh, yeah. It's uh, there's a um, bunch of other, you know, specific nights. And so I don't know. I, I, I kind of want to go back to like you were talking about um, working with most deaf. And I actually was working the same event as you kind of recently uh, this year, earlier this year. Um, it was for those uh, uh, smoked out 
event oh, yeah, at, yeah, yeah. in Monterey Bay. And it was hella funny because I got there a day early because my brother lives in Monterey. Um, and I went there a day early just to chill with my brother. And I was like, he wasn't home yet. And I was just like, I'm going to go get my credentials. So I went for the next day because I wasn't on the first day. It's on the second day. But you were on both days hosting. And so, like, I was about to leave because I didn't see anybody. And you're like, hey, Vic. And it, of course, Rick is, <laughs> and I didn't see you forever because, you know, the pandemic and all that. And yeah. I'm like, I was like, Rick, dude, you look great. You're skinny. You're gorgeous. What the fuck? Yeah. Like, I'm just like, it, and it was like all this, like, like awesome. It, like, it felt good to see you because I was like, dude, I almost walked away and left. And you're like, dog, there's sandwiches right there if you want. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, damn, dude, this is this is love. This is Bay Love in Monterey Bay, and technically, this is like the South Bay, or I don't know what you want to consider that. I don't even know. They're like, no, that's Central Coast. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's the South South Bay. I don't know. I'm not repping. I'm not claiming shit. You know what I mean? Because then, you know, I don't want to start no funks with nobody. But uh, right. that's that's uh, one of the things I want to <laughs> ask you though about like how. I mean, I'm sorry. Um, What's the difference between hosting a comedy club and hosting a rap concert like you did at the Monterey County Fairgrounds for that smoked out barbecue fest? Uh, I, the difference is with comedy and hosting music is comedy, when you're hosting a music event, music is the star. So you don't necessarily have to do jokes or anything. You just have to kind of be personal you have to make people excited you have to get to keep the crowd energy up for the performers and it's kind of the same thing when you do comedy it's just a different type of energy you know with comedy you want people to stay focused on the comedian and, and be attentive and listen whereas with music people don't necessarily have to be as attentive to listen you know because music can go background but it's just all about creating a vibe in the environment that you're in you know outdoor outdoor music fest is you know we're trying to get the crowd amped up especially at a weed festival where everybody's super baked it's like okay how do we keep that energy level up? how do we keep them how do we keep them at this point so i want to create that energy you know create the energy that's all sorry i don't mean to laugh it's just like you're like yeah especially at a weed concert it's just like i mean like weed mm -hmm. shows i mean there's comedy shows with that are weed infused where the audience can smoke weed and they're baked out of their ass, and like sometimes it's like they're they're just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's them laughing their ass off because they're just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the response is delayed. Like like exactly at a at a weed <laughs> comedy show, I'm not going to be as energetic as I would be because sometimes you got to meet people where their energy is. Like there's nothing worse than you being super high energy and everybody's being real low energy, and you don't meet them at that energy. And, and, and try to bring them up. Like I, I meet them there and then try to bring them up to where I need them to be um, instead of staying up here and be like, come up where I'm at, come up where I'm at. Because a lot of times they're hot. They don't know what they're doing. So you gotta guide them up the path to higher energy. Like you gotta say, hey, hey, look, this is a show. So be attentive, be here, have a great time. Are you guys ready? You know, and you kind of give them that. You don't, you, you don't, you give them the option. You know, you, you help them navigate their way towards the energy you need them to be at. No, that's excellent advice, and it's just like I don't know, like the the whole like uh, they're here, they're here to see music, not comedy. So right. it's just like you're getting them hyped up for the show, and it's just like you're making everybody sound like a million bucks when you're introducing yeah. them. And so. and also, there's different kinds of music too. Like it's there was a rap concert, so rap level of energy is way because rap is more interactive. Rap is like throw your hands in the air, somebody say ho, oh. you know. Rap, you want that back and forth energy, which is kind of like comedy. You kind of need that interaction. You need the audience to laugh. You need them to talk to them. You want them to respond. Whereas like I've hosted a jazz concert and the energy is way different. You're more like, hey guys, thanks for coming out. We got some great music acts coming up. Uh, you guys give it up for such such. We let them do the little clap and then they sit back and they're taking in the music as opposed to interacting with the music. Um, so with hip hop, yeah, it's very interactive. So you got to keep that energy level in between where they're at, where you want them to be, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tough job sometimes. I always think it's it is fun. a tough job. I mean, sometimes it's not easy, but just like I don't know, it feels like you have you're having fun as opposed to not working. And sometimes you're just like, it was funny though because I legit asked you about that event. I was like, hey, bro, how did that? How did that? other room do you know that and then you're just like hey dog and you were like being optimistic as fuck 
without like, you were just like everybody who earned a laugh in that room earned it. Real. Yeah, no. And and I we'll was gonna, like, yeah. I was I read through the lines right then and there, and I was like, oh, oh, this is gonna be a fucking battle, dude. Because like the way I was booked on that show was like, hey, you wanna you wanna open for E forty and two short? Yeah, and I'm right, like, right. Fuck yeah, I do. That that's amazing. And then it's just like, oh, actually, you're not on the same stage. You're on this other stage. And then I was booked to go on at the same time as Too Short. So there was yeah. like 12 people who were like too tired to stand up, sitting down in the yeah. other room. And it was just like, it was like, it was legit. Yeah, like you I were got an paid. overflow. It was just like, yeah, it was oh, like, I, I, it was so funny though. It was just like, yeah, we gave them a bunch of notes about like how to, it was, but, but it was fun. It was, it was, it was fun, yeah. but it was like, dude, that was, it was that work. was exactly Exactly wanted... how you described it, like totally, one hundred percent cutthroat, like, and that's what I always loved about you, Riggins, and still love about you. It's just like, you know, out of like all the cats that I've known, you've always been genuinely honest the whole time, like on it's 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 been so cool, and it's just like one of the things I wanted to talk about, and you know, it's it's, it's super important, you know, for all entertainers, and I think it's. I think it's great because like a lot of people are scared to get sober because they're scared that mm-hmm. if they get sober, they're not going to be funny anymore. They're going to lose their edge. And then you got sober and not only are you funnier, you look better. Not, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, pause. Yeah. I don't know, whatever the fuck. <laughs> I, 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 no, it's a genuine compliment. Like, you know, it's a genuine like because I saw you and I was just like, like, I was like, I was like, bro, you look good. You don't look sick. You You look skinny. You look like. Like, damn, bro, you got, like, the Hollywood treatment right here, bro. Like, you took the pandemic right. seriously. I, I took it the other way. I went up to 406 pounds, and you're just like, nope, I'm going to lose all the weight Victor's gaining. And so, like, it was yeah. just like, because you were, like, you, you were pudgy. But then you I was took like, all my weight for me. Dude, Thanks I, for I, taking I, that weight for me. I, I did, but then I lost 108 <laughs> pounds, so somebody else got it. Out. Some, 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 some yeah, that's how it transfer. You know, it's a transfer of fatness. No, but no, because, like, uh, sometimes, I don't know, it feels, I would never have considered you a fat comic, because at most you were portly. You yeah. were like you were like bare like like you bare not even. I still had skinny really. legs. You had skinny legs, <laughs> so it's just, like you, just it was, upper body fat. It was uh, it was I, I don't know it might have been the booze but like it's just like I don't know I wanted to ask you like with the with with the way mental health is there's like so many comedians that are too young passing away like and like it's it's I don't know what it is it hasn't been like and I don't want to like be here uh, talking about like the, the drug epidemic that is but cocaine ain't safe no more you know i joke no. about doing coke but it's really not oh it's not, it's safe. not safe anymore unless you're buying it all. in spanish from the cartel directly it is not fucking safe yeah like yeah. like honestly like it is really dangerous out there and like i really like all these people are dying so young and they and they're healthy and it's just like i don't know if it's intentional like a suicide or if it's like a legitimate accidental because like i've known a lot of people who've accidentally fatally overdosed and it's tragic and i've yeah. known people who've done it on purpose to kill themselves which is also tragic but it's just like what do you think would be the best advice for somebody who, who's an entertainer who's looking to get sober do it like it's it's one of those things where it's like with sobriety the fear it's it's changing your life has always come with some fear. Like, you know, say you want to decide you, you want to go back to school and you know that's going to affect your whole schedule because now you got to study, you got to go to class. And so you're afraid that you might not make as much money at work now because you're going to be doing this at a third. The fear is always greater than the actual event. Um, so it, it's one of those things that you have to do it um, because like, you know, what comes with it is so much more rewarding than what doesn't come with it. You know, fighting through sobriety, fighting through addiction. And that's what it really boils down to. A lot of people don't want to admit that they are addicts. Um, uh, people, ha- our society has, has casually encouraged drinking so much that we don't realize that we're walking through a nation of, of pretty much alcoholics, addicts. We're all, alcohol is a drug just like cocaine. It's just that it's more socially acceptable drug uh, because it doesn't kill you as quick. Because it has to, like, you know, the only depths we really talk about with alcohol is drunk driving. And that's like, oh, my God. And, and drunk driving happens a lot, but alcohol poisoning happens a lot. And then alcohol will lead you to do other stuff. Like, the, the reason why a lot of those people don't quit before they have the fatal, the fatal overdose is because they are, in fact, addicted to cocaine. And kicking addiction 
is the key. Kicking the addiction of it is, is the hard part because you become dependent on the drug. You think you need that drug to be social. You think you need that drug to be funny. You think you need that drug to cope with whatever's going on in your life because we come from a, a culture of, of pill popping. You know, like I watched a documentary on Xanax the other night and how at one point in our medical history, doctors didn't even ask you what's causing your sadness or the traumas you've been through. They just said, here, you're sad, take a pill, take a pill, take a pill. And then you become addicted to that pill. And when you get off that pill, you know, like I have a cousin, uh, my cousin, rest in peace, Shakir Stewart. Shakir Stewart is from Oakland. He is the man that signed Destiny's Child to their first record deal. He is, when you, if you talk to anybody in the record industry that came, that's been in the record industry for more than 20 years, you bring up Shakir Stewart, they would be like, Shake, oh, that guy was a legend. Shake had it all. But Shake, Shakir was taking antidepressants. And when he tried to kick the antidepressants, the addiction made him feel like he needed to kill himself. And he took his own life. And it's super tragic because. Oh my God. Had he been given the tools to deal with what was causing the depression as opposed to the medication to cover the depression, he might still be alive today. Um, you know, and one of the things that we, we, we take for granted is that, yeah, it's an addiction. And just like, like any kind of addiction that you have, you have to first find the causes. What are the causes as opposed to what's the outcome? You know, so it's if, if people are struggling and wanting to get sober, it's just a matter of doing it. like I just had to do it. Like I literally just one morning woke up and took myself to a treatment center and started doing outpatient treatment and getting drug tested every week and and, and, and removing myself from certain certain, certain envir environments where that behavior was encouraged or other people are still doing that behavior because at the end of the day, I can't force anybody else to get sober. But when I'm doing my, my journey, I, I literally have to separate myself from people. And it has affected me. Like, you know, I don't get invited to a lot of things anymore because people assume because I don't drink or do drugs, I, I don't want to have fun. And I'm like, nah, I, I still like to have fun. I just do it without the crutch. I do it without the extra added. Now I go to a concert and I remember the whole concert. I go hang out with Dave Chappelle and, and all these celebrities and I remember the experience as opposed to just blurring through it. So it's a it's a, it's definitely a step up for for to do it. So like with the blurring, that's just like numbing of emotions so you don't have to deal with them, correct? Well you're the result is you miss out on so many things that you're experiencing. Like missing out on my kids because Instead of spending a Sunday with my kids at the park or doing whatever, I'm spending my Sunday in the bed recovering from two nights of party. And I can't, I physically can't get out the bed because my body is so drained of serotonin and energy. And it's so, it's been, I've been so high that the come down takes me beneath. And then that affects your mental too, because now you feel bad. Now you're like, oh man, I'm a terrible dad because my kids are here and I'm, I'm too over, I'm too hungover to interact with them. So all they're getting is is they only see me when I'm when I'm high, and then when I'm not high, they see me in a whole other state. And that right there was enough for me to switch it up. Dude, that's powerful. That's 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 yeah. extremely powerful because you know it's this isn't an easy business, and you know a lot of a lot of entertainers do rely on this crutch. A lot of entertainers do justify their drinking, pill popping, whatever form, whether it's Xanax, because the thing about Xanax, it's that's instant. If you take a Xanax right now, you'll feel in like 10 minutes. If you take a Prozac, you got to take that shit for six to eight weeks before you start feeling anything. And then, right. and then when you start feeling the effects of the pill, you don't feel anything. And then you feel dead inside and you feel like, yeah. well, it's like, why even bother going on? So it's yep. just like, that's while you're on the medication. So you sharing that story um, about the legendary producer uh, taking his own life after he got off the medication. And it's just like, that's important, like talk therapy and doing the. I mean, I don't know, like it's just like sometimes you go into these mental health clinics and they want you to be on Abilify right now or well, because they get money right now. Uh, Absolutely. And it's like, no, no, it's no, a I financial talk thing. about it. 
But it's just like, like nah. I mean, because that's why, because think about it. It's cheaper to get the medication it is to get therapy. That's crazy. I can go with my medical uh, insurance and get medicated, but I can't use it to necessarily get treatment, to get therapy, which is what I really, what you really need, as opposed to being over-medicated. You need to learn. Like, because what the medication does is it, it takes away your ability to learn how to cope with bad things. Because the thing about life is it's, it's, a, it's a combination of good and bad and indifferent and how you deal with these things. And if every time something bad happens, you numb yourself and try to run away from it. There comes a point where you don't have that numbing agent and now you have to face it, but you never gave yourself the tools to face it. You don't even know how to, it's like, it's like if you wanna be a boxer, right? You can't just go get into a couple of bar fights and think, okay, I'm gonna step in the ring with uh, uh, Canelo. Canelo. I'm gonna step in the ring with Mayweather now because I got into a couple of bar fights and didn't get knocked out. No, you gotta train. You gotta train yourself to deal with that. So when that first punch hits you, you know not to cower in the corner and hide. You're like, oh, I got punched. All right, punch back, punch back, punch back. And you know, and you 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 get to nurture your 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 fight response as opposed to your flight response. Jesus, I mean, I'm just I'm just overwhelmed with information because it's just like this is like I'm I'm getting free therapy right now, and um, that that's not why I invited you to the podcast. So I'm just telling you, it's just like it's therapeutic to hear from another man of color, and it's just like it, it, it's it's a stigma within the black and brown community to even talk about this. And that's why even before I press record, I was like, hey, is it cool to talk about mental health? You're like, fuck yeah, it's cool, dude. Yeah, yeah. And then I, like, yeah part we of have it was, to. We have to, because if we don't, if we don't, the media will not show our people, any of us in therapy. Like you watch The Sopranos, they show Tony Soprano, the whole series was had, had, had scenes with him just with his therapist, but it doesn't do the same for us, you know? Right. Yeah, like, you know, it doesn't give us the same images. Well, I mean, I don't know, man. I mean, like with with the way the the mental health is handled in this country is I feel like it's a farce. And it's just like you have to have cash or if you don't, you have to wait six months. And if you're depressed as shit, what the fuck are you going to do between now and those six months? And right. So it's just like. I don't have two hundred and fifty dollars per hour to see this therapist for three hours, three times a week for the next ten yep. weeks. Like I don't, I really don't. I don't have, I don't have the time for that shit either. So it's just yes. like, uh, like it's just like a huge investment. I mean, unless you're like gonna go into inpatient rehabilitation center, which is also stigmatized. So it's just like it is just, and then people tell you don't get better. You're not, you're gonna, you need to be miserable to be funny, but you've proven them yeah. wrong. It's yeah. like you've totally proven them wrong. And it's just like, I, 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 you know, really congratulate you for that because, like, I feel like like that's part of part of your overall success. But even before then, I mean, even when you were using, you're fucking hilarious, dude. I mean, you've been hilarious the whole time I've known you. So it's, and also very humble, very humble, very cool, very like, um, I don't know. Next wife doesn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> No, man, it's cool because, like, you know, like, like, uh, so sober Chris is fucking cool, and sober Chris is, you know, but also drunk Chris was also very intellectual too. But, um, <laughs> but sober Chris is very intellectual as well. So it's just like I'm glad that 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 never affected you. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, hey, wait, I might be fucked up, but well, the thing about it is, most people don't realize that you're funny without it. Like, if you get on stage and tell jokes, you are naturally funny. There are very few people that get on stage and are not naturally funny. Like, um, I believe those people usually go into right. But being on stage <laughs> takes a degree of natural funniness because you have to be up there. Um, and I think I said, like you said, the people's fear is that if they stop doing this, they think the funny comes from the, the, the substance. And it's not the substance. The substance may have given you a little bit more courage to get on the stage. But once you're on the stage, that's natural. That's what's coming out of you. So to remove that crutch means you have to find a new way to give yourself the courage to get on stage. And I think it's just the fear of change for people more than the fear of not being funny. Hmm. 
No, man. I mean, I, I mean, I know what you're saying, but like, there's people that would argue, like, no, dude, I gotta be fucked up. Oh, yeah. Because I swear to God, like, one of the best sets I ever had, I was on Molly, and I was just, dude, right. I, I was riffing. I was like, like, really, like, killing it. Like, I was like, damn, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be famous soon. I just gotta keep this Molly connection. But by day, okay, right. then, at set one was great. You know, next day, set two was fucking great on Molly. Right, set three. I died so hard on stage. Like, I, like, literally thought about, like, just quitting comedy and just, like, yeah. that's it. It's over. It's, like, that was embarrassing. That was one of the worst sets I've ever had in my life. And, right. like, you're supposed to do – this is your, your sports enhancement. Like, you can't do that shit. It was, like, a three-day experiment. You know what I mean? Right. See if it worked and, you know, no. Eventually, it's going to not work. It's not going to – The day issues. That's important. That's important to mention because it's just, like, you know, the, the, party, the party ends. The party's over and it's just like, you know, I mean, it's just we're looking for instant results, but also we get instant reactions and, you know, consequences to what we put in our bodies. And it's just like one of those things I've learned. It's just like I know I'm still morbidly obese, but it's just like I've lost like a bunch of weight since the pandemic because I changed my diet and I don't eat past eight anymore. And that's so hard, man, not eating past eight. And like actually. It's like, bro, it's like, okay, cool. You're going to do a show. Well, you better eat before the first show. And sometimes when you eat before you go on stage, you get, you get like, I don't know, this type of like, I want, I want to go to sleep. I was just about to say, I want to go to sleep. You said the itis. That's hella funny. No, I mean, it's just like, no, it's like you, you eat. And you're like, you know what? A nap right now sounds pretty good. Oh, wait, mm-hmm. I got to go do a comedy show. Okay. Right. Fuck. But it's just like, like, it's like, so when do you eat exactly? It's just like, you know, it's just like, do you eat during the show? And then if you're doing three yeah. shows that night or one or two shows, it's when exactly do you do it? Or if you're hosting, is it, do, do you eat between sets? Like after you start the show before, the, uh, you know, after the second comic or something or when? Right, right. You know, so it's just, I, I don't know. It's just like one of those things, like what helped you lose weight? Uh, change of diet, working out, um, no, not drinking. Like literally the, the, I lost a quite substantial amount of weight from removing that sugar intake. Because the thing we all right, we forget is that when you drink alcohol, I think pretty much every alcohol, except for vodka from my, from my understanding, uh, the sugar content in alcohol is so great that when you are taking in that sugar, um, your body is just uh, metabolizing it and it's not going anywhere. Um, that's one of the reasons why when people, most people, you ask most people who, who, who quit drinking, they'll tell you when you first stop drinking, you want to eat candy every day because your body is craving that sugar. Your body says, Hey, what happened to all that sugar you were taking in every night? Like we were drinking a pint of whiskey and now we're not doing that. And that sugar that we were getting in our system don't exist no more. So where do we get it from? In our mind it is candy candy instead of fruits you know like like i should go eat some strawberries grapes or, or cantaloupe or something but now i'm gonna go get some skittles or some snickers bars and continue to put that sugar in um because your body just needs it. dude as a fat guy that is so profound and as a guy who enjoys a drink that's extra profound because that is right here dude. all this stuff right here all this dude. weight that men men when we have all this weight up in our face our cheeks are swollen that's alcohol. That's literally alcohol shit. You take that, like, literally, as soon as I stopped drinking, my face right. slimmed down. For the record, I wasn't an alcoholic when I was eight. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, there's I, also different metabolisms, different yeah, body types. It was just like, like, dude, you're, not a, <laughs> you're not a small person. It'd be different if you were, like, five, two. Dude, you that's, that's, I, I've said that before. It's just like, if I was an Oompa Loompa Mexican, like, you know, yeah. and that's, well, that's what like, are you like six, you're like six, two, right? I'm six, two and I'm full of goo, but I'm six, two by six, two. So I look like you're not six, yeah. two. You're not six, you're supposed two. To, you you would like, look weird if you weigh less than 185 pounds. Like you're bro, supposed that, to be. That's my ideal weight, supposedly between 185 and 220. Yeah, and then even at 220, a... I'm just like, I think I would look like people like my mom's all like she hadn't seen me in months. She thought I had gastric bypass. She's like, you look like you have gastric bypass surgery. Yeah. And, yeah. and like, the thing is, like, Thanks. think about think about NFL players. Like, there are guys in the NFL that are 6'5", 300 pounds naturally, and they play a sport. They work out. They run. They they push. They they do all this, this cardio and stuff, and they still are very big people. But it's about being healthy at your size. You know?
don't look at like it's not. I think it's unfair that we we take you know people that are your height and we expect them to keep up the the the, the health standards of somebody who is half your size physically, like body size, just half your size because that's not like you would be you would be more sick if you weighed 150 pounds than you are at 200 because 150 pounds your bones probably won't be getting the nourishment because you're depriving yourself of something so it's a matter of how you shape that size you know what i mean like yeah. even having a belly does not necessarily mean you're healthy it just means maybe your body index is different you know and your metabolism works different like every human has a different inside like inside system that works different so it's like you know find what works for you find your healthiness instead of looking at other people's healthiness and say i want to be that no that's not for you and that's that's solid that's solid advice man and like that sounds like something like it, something you abide by and so it's like you live by it you're not i i i, I hate these people and that would be like me giving out like i don't know like health advice about you know to to skinny people i mean if there's like other fat guys that are fatter than me i'm just like hey you can lose weight too you know, right. you know, it's motivation. Like, hey, I, I did it. You could do it too. But I mean, I'm not going to lecture skinny people on how to be healthy, you know? So, right. but I mean, I don't know. It just feels like, I, I don't know. Sometimes just like fat comics hate on other fat comics just because they think yeah. you're going to do all the fat jokes. And it's just like, I never saw it. Like, even when you were portly, I was like, no. And I got to stop saying portly. I was not trying to backhanded compliment <laughs> you. I'm just trying not to say fat or chubby because you weren't fat or chubby. We was husky like, back in the day. You were husky then. If I let's say husky then, because I'm like, <laughs> am I backhanded complimenting my, my man right here? Because like, no, Chris, Chris Riggins is my friend. I love him. Like, he's really, really hilarious. Like, um, I want to ask you a question about the name of your title of your album, my fifth first album. When I yes. saw that, I was laughing my ass off. Like, who names their album? That, that is so funny. So, what happened with albums one through four then? Basically, or was that just I, recorded, a... I recorded four of the comedy albums and due to unforeseen circumstances, none of them saw the light of day. Uh, a cup, one of them, the guy that the, the, an engineer I had who was going to edit it and all that, he lost all the files. He lost the zip drive. So oh, that one was gone. And that was the no. one I had Talib Kweli on. Like I had Talib fly to San Francisco, introduce me, all this, and dude lost it. Um, and then there's other, just other circumstances. Like I wasn't happy with one of them. I didn't like, I was like, I don't want this one. Like, it, didn't, it didn't sound the way I wanted it to. The jokes were the jokes I wanted to use. So I was like, nah, I'm not putting it out. And in hindsight, I probably should have. Um, but then when I got to this one, you know, I hooked up with uh, Dominic Del Bene at uh, Blonde Medicine Records, and he was like, I want to put an album out with you. And I, you know, I'm so used to promise makers and not promise keepers, but he kept his promise and he put it out. So I felt like the most appropriate name would be like, this is my fifth first album. It's my fifth <laughs> attempt at a first comedy album that was successful. That's hilarious, man. Dude, I mean, I think that's really awesome, man. I mean, um, after you release that album, like, do you feel like pressure, like, to, to come up with new material, or is it just like people are there to hear that? You know, it's album? funny with it's funny with comedy. In some circumstances, it is people do want to hear the classics. They want to hear this joke that they liked that you did online, or they want to hear a joke that they heard that you did on stage. And for the most part, it's like not every audience has seen every joke, so you can definitely use older use those jokes again but for me the way i work i try to come up with a new 20 minutes of comedy every month um, 20 minutes just, yeah i try to i try to think in 20 minute intervals because the way my the way my jokes are written the way i do my jokes the way i interact with the crowd during my jokes and around my jokes these are not meant to be short quick jokes these are jokes that build on to other jokes and that go into other jokes and that are always something fresh. Like, you know, I try to think something fresh. And then also I remix jokes. Like there's jokes I did seven years ago that I'll bring back because something new happened that connects to that joke, you know, or I'm reminded of that joke by something that happens again. And I remember, oh, that was a good joke. I'm gonna bring that joke back. Like I have a joke detailing how, how kind of, how, how the sport of American football it's kind of like I could see why it's attractive to gay men, you know. It's about, <laughs> you know, it's about how 
I think how I know if you really look at yeah, if you really look at football, it's really like, yeah, if I was a gay dude, I'd watch football all day. Like what all these big men jumping on top of each other. Mm -hmm. I like that. Like <laughs> you know, and, and I think, it's I think... it's it's a a joke I did seven years ago, but I keep bringing it back because it still rings true. Um, and I haven't recorded it, so it's like I, I can keep doing it. Okay. For the record, if anyone steals that joke, you're an asshole and you hear it here. So straight up. Straight up for the record. We're gonna publish this on Tuesday. <laughs> so we're not fucking around. Uh but no, um, yeah, man. Um, I think it's great what you're doing, man. I think that every I didn't and like I was really stoked, dude, because like when I when I moved out of the bay, I'm like, dude, I'm not even in the Bay Area Comedy Network anymore, bro. I'm like not even yeah. like like I'm like I'm like not I don't blame you. It's and, it's a cesspool. <laughs> I didn't even mean it like that. I just meant like I'm not in the bay anymore. So it's just like that's cool that there's a new open mic, or that's cool that there's a, like a bunch of open mics tonight, and that's awesome. But I'm just like I'm not in the bay, and if I'm in the bay, it's like I'm I'm like I'll hit up my people, and if I get on a show, I get on a show, and if yeah. I don't, I don't. You know what I mean? It's just like so. I don't know. Right, I just right. I just always thought the way that um you've handled crowds has been great. It's been brilliant, and you you're a brilliant riffer. Um. Do you have any advice on either riffing, being in the moment, like, or uh, just, yeah, being in the moment on stage, like when you're riffing That's or it. doing crowd work, just just being in the moment. You know, like being in the moment is is exactly what you want to do because in the moment you're gonna see a lot of stuff, and if you're an observant comedian, you can see something. And then a lot of times when you're riffing, you're actually reusing stuff that you've said before. You know, because like the way I see audiences there's always the same people in the audience even if they're different people you know what i mean like there's always going to be that overly drunk person that thinks they help the show by talking too much there's going to be <laughs> the, the person who's who didn't want to sit in the front row but ended up getting put in the front row anyway there's going to be the couple there that might just had an argument in the car and they're not they're sitting in a in a, in a very aggressive way to each other you know it's all you know and it's just a matter of being observant you know, kind of being in the moment, you know, reading the room, watching, watching, you know, like I would say it's more reading the room, you know, Dude, understanding I, your audience. I don't, I, I just seen certain people handle it different ways. Like I saw this dude aggressively down here in SoCal go after a, like a couple in the front row. It was a dude's birthday. And then he asked the woman, are you going to, are you going to give him a birthday blow job? And she said, no. And then he was just on her for five minutes about how shitty of a girlfriend that he is and that she deserves to be cheated on. Like right in front for five, like to the wow. point where like some of it was hysterical, but some of it was like, okay, dude, still a business. They are paying customers. Yeah. What the fuck is going on right now? Like it was like one of those things. And like, I'm not judging the person. Like a dude was funny, but it was like one of those things. I'm like, I know you're digging this hole. But like, there's ways to like. Uh, Fifty percent yeah. of it was hysterical, but fifty percent of it was like, "Dude, you this, might be causing a, a relationship to fail right now." If you want to, it's fun. Like, I have no problem with, with making fun of the crowd and talking to the crowd, but I try to keep my my jokes when I'm making fun of the crowd kind of uh, lighthearted, very like very 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 surface. And then another way you do that is you make fun of yourself as well. Like if you have made fun of yourself on stage, when you make fun of somebody in the crowd, it's not as harsh. You know, it's not as like, oh, he's picking on him. It's like, well, he said he was ugly too. So I guess, you know, whatever, <laughs> or, you know, however you do it. Um, it's just, you know, yeah, they are paying customers. Do you want them to have a good time? And it's okay to like, you know, hey, you know, are you going to give your, your dude a, a birthday BJ and she's like no and it's okay to make a little fun of that like oh come on girl hook your man up blah, 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 blah. but there's different directions you can go you know I probably wouldn't shame her I would probably oh, go oh, into it, more like I'd oh. probably go more to like try to try to convince her I would probably try to go the route of trying to trying to speak his side of the situation like come on look at the guy he looks like he deserves one he probably be turning him down all the time from from ugly women and you are beautiful like it's his birthday you know make sure you make eye contact with him while you do it like i, I would <laughs> more encourage you as opposed to condemn her for her decision because like i said you said you don't know what happened you know she might have caught him cheating 
the night before. I'm like, I don't want to suck that dirty dick. I don't want to put that. I don't know where it's been. <laughs> that you dirty ass that. dick. Yeah, no, See, no. I, it's I, cool. Oh, no, no. And you're absolutely right. That's what I was saying. Like, like that might be that might be a relationship that's hanging on by threads and it's just like this is what's happening and it's just like you're at a comedy show and it's just like one of the worst things i ever seen was like somebody came to a comedy show and it was like one of those shitty ass shows where there was like only like three or four people in the crowd there's actually only three people in the crowd and somebody made a cancer joke and, and like it was like one of those things like pretty much a punchline is just like you know if you pray to god that your kid is going to get better from cancer you're a fucking idiot and your kid's going to die that was a punchline right and so Somebody in the front row, like out of the three people, like was just like, not funny. Next joke, and then the whole time the comedian was just all like, arguing, saying comedy's subjective. If you don't like it, you can stand the fuck up, get the fuck out right now. And I was just like, holy shit. And so like I stuck around because I had a good set, and I wanted to talk to them, be like, hey, I'm sorry that you went through that. Like I'm like you know like I don't know what's going on. And then like because I thought it was like a boyfriend and a girlfriend situation, but they're like old high school buddies or whatever. And her kid was at Oakland Children's Hospital fighting leukemia and is stage four. And are the only miracle, the only chance they have is a miracle, and they are praying to God. And so what wow. this comedian just said was be it was it was a learning moment for Victor for sure. It was like one of those like Holy shit. Thank God I just talked about me and not hypotheticals. You know, yeah. I'm just yes. like, yeah. That's why I try to keep a lot of my comedy about Chris. <laughs> you can't you can't get mad at me if I make a joke about my my problems. Right. You know? Right. Or you, people, you can relate. Right, right. But I mean it's always um it's always to try to relate to the crowd. It's always tried. I mean, not to pander, but just to get them to like to be universal. I mean, I don't know, like I'll do the same set um, if, like, you know, like for a formal, like, comedy club in San Francisco, San Jose, Long Beach, San Diego, and it will work in all four fucking places. And that's because, like, when I'm in San Francisco, I'll say Muni. And when I'm anywhere else, I'll say I, was, I took the subway. The bus, yeah. Or the, or, or the metro or, like, tra public transportation or anything. But it's just like, what the fuck is Muni? You leave the Bay Area, right. it's like, what the fuck is Muni? And I've even seen some Bay Area comics outside of the Bay Area at multiple places. Like, yeah, talking about Muni, like, like freely. And I'm just like, people don't know what Muni is. People know what BART is, but not Muni. It's fucking yeah. crazy. It's like, people are like, oh, I know what BART is. Oh, we know about BART. We always hear about, like, people, like, either, like, you know, the BART's all fucked up or the BART was down or somebody threw themselves on the third rail or whatever the fuck happened. You right, know, right. BART, BART gets play on the on the news, the media, you know, like, worldwide and shit, you know. Because, exactly. And, you know, not to mention all the injustices. I mean, uh, but with, with comedy, it's just like, I, I have a question. Um, what's there that us black and brown comedians can do? to try to get more of this mainstream attention? Uh, well, first thing we have to stop doing is considering mainstream white. There's mainstream black and brown, too. Um, I think that's, that's a great point. Great point. There's really not much you can do other than just be funny. You know, just try to be as universally funny as possible. Um, there are like, for instance, in, in both the black and brown comedy communities, people who are very specific to the culture or to issues that black and brown people face. And sometimes it gets so specific that audiences outside of those communities, even like, you know, there's, there's Mexican comedians who, who, who are brown comedians who do material that's so culturally based that I don't get it because I don't understand that culture. I'm not from that culture. You know, right. or like, for instance, here in California, I grew up with Mexicans, and I'm going to say Northern California, I grew up here with Mexican and El Salvadorians. Um, and uh, in New York, they're, they're Puerto Rican and Dominican. Uh, right. In the South, they're, they're Tejano or whatever. And so there's different versions, there's different, you know, cultures within the culture. So the, the goal is to either, like, if you can explain your culture through your jokes and make it to where people can see the similarities in their culture, in your culture. Like, you know, point out, like, we're more similar than we are different. And then there's right. also the whole, like, only my people are going to get this joke. Only my people are going to understand it. And it's a blend of doing that. So you just have to try to be, like I said, be as universally as funny as possible. Like, during this competition, 
all the audiences were pretty much white, middle-aged, and older. Um, some of them were middle class, some were rich, some of them were poor. But I, one thing I know is we all got kids. We all have marriages. We all have relationships. So instead of me going specifically into material that is about being black or blackness, I can go into material about my kids. And it doesn't matter what color my kids are, because my kids are going to do the same stupid things that your kids are going to do. And we can relate on that. And then I could squeeze in some of that, hey, but you know, black people, you know. <laughs> that so was it's, a matter, about... it's a matter how you do it. You know, are, are you, the mainstream is only mainstream to those who see it. Like you can be successful in any stream, you know. And I think a lot of times, you know, we exclude ourselves sometimes, but then there's also the exclusions of societal uh systematic you know systematic racism and, and sexism like it's the same thing for women you know a lot of times men think women aren't funny because they think that all women are going to talk about is their period and, and these women issues and it's like once you realize that women are human too that they, they actually go through the same thing that men go through just you know in heels and backwards it's just a whole different thing you know it's a whole different mindset and you just have to get out of that mindset that we're all so different that we can't relate to each other dude i mean one of my top three favorite comics of all time is a woman ida rodriguez she's like fucking hysterical she's great and so um it's just like i never saw her like oh i was like oh this is a woman comic i never saw her or like this is a latina comic i was like oh this is a comic that I know from a podcast where Joey Diaz gave her the stars of death and she got so fucked up that she had to have her son drive her, drive her to the hospital. And I'm just like, holy shit, that poor, that, that, that poor woman. But also though, like, and she was funny on the podcast. So I checked her out live um, at the punchline at San Francisco. And it was just like, she was hysterical, hysterical. And I just like told her, it was like, she was, she was so gracious and so, so funny. And it was like on a Thursday night, like, you know, sometimes, some headliners will phone it in on a Thursday night. You know, it's not it's not the weekend, you know, like certain like that demographic that night was, as you described, like middle aged white. Um, but there were some thick ass Puerto Rican women there. I was like, holy shit. I'll do respect. But like, you know, it was uh, I'll do respect. I'll do respect. But I was just like, oh, my God. I'm like, this is whoa. It's a real show. Uh, but um, no, of course, they're all real shows. It's at the punchline. Every show at the punchline is really cool. Um, <laughs> so um, I was going to say, like, how has winning the San Francisco International Comedy Competition, how has that changed your career? Or like, I mean, because you're still a kind, not cocky jerk. You're still a <laughs> sweetheart. And so I'm just like, 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 but career wise, like, this is a huge competition to win and you won it. Yeah. Well, it opens up doors, you know, there, there's it opens up doors to different shows. Uh, now I get to do a lot of the best of the festival shows with John Fox, who is the producer. Um, and these shows, you know, taking me out of the Bay area into different parts of California and different crowds. Like I just did uh, Santa Rosa and a couple other spots with him. Um, one of the things is like, it's a real like in the industry it's a real big deal because like everybody i've told that's in the industry have been like wow that's a big competition to win because it's been around for 46 years i mean i don't know any other thing in comedy i know that's been around that long other than you know like the comedy store so uh it's one of those things where people respect it you know and i look at the list of comedians who won it and the list of comedians who didn't even win but were in it you know like like i'm you know, I just ran into Tony Baker not too long ago, and he won it in 2012. Uh, and that's been a guy I've been looking up to for a minute, like, wow, yeah, I, I need know. to get on like Tony. And then, you know, to be in that fraternity of winners comes with the perks of, you know, now I have uh, uh, an accolade that isn't based on another performer. You know, like, oh, a lot dude. Of times, absolutely people, and, people talk about you know oh you open up for Chappelle yeah that's dope I really appreciate it I'm glad that I'm able to call Dave and go open up for him and, and be able to share that stage but now it's my accolade I did that Dave Chappelle didn't vote to help me win he didn't write the jokes he didn't help he didn't win the show the contest for me I did it on my own I did Chris it Riggins. With, that was all Chris all Riggins, Chris Riggins. Yeah. So it's so, my it's my accomplishments, my yeah. accolade, it's my and, my credit. 
again, like I said, like I was just as soon as I found out about it, I fucking hit you up and I was like, I don't even know what time it is right now. But like just in case I die of a massive heart attack tonight, just want you to know. Like I didn't say that part. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Yeah. I was just like, I was like, dude, that congratulations, man. That's big. That's super big. Yeah. Like, like I was just like really like I was like that like so deserving, very, very like I know how hard yeah. you work and the whole the whole schedule for people that don't know for the San Francisco International Comedy Competition, you are all over the state of California. Like for a all, month. For a month. For, for three weeks of your life throughout the month of September. <laughs> you drive pretty much from the top of California to the bottom, from the east to the west of California doing shows. Because you have to do four shows every week. And every show is in a different city that's at least 50 miles away from San Francisco. So you literally, and then you don't get paid for every show. You don't get paid until you advance. So when you advance to the semifinals, you get paid. When you advance to the finals, you get some money. And then, of course, winning it, you get money. But at the end of the day, it's like you don't, you're sacrificing a lot of time and energy to do it. It's a stamina contest. It's not even really, it's a comedy competition, but it's a <laughs> stamina competition too. You know, That's a lot so of people, funny. I, I know a lot, of, a lot of, I've talked to a lot of people who've done it and they were doing great in the competition and then just the, the, the wear and tear of the competition got to them towards the end of the competition and they didn't win, you know? And I kind of see how that happened because I wasn't, I feel like this, when I started the competition, I was coming in second and third place the whole time. <laughs> and then everybody, the two guys, the two people that kept beating me in the prelims in the semifinals didn't make it to the finals, but I did because I stayed steady and kept moving up. And then when I got to the finals, it was just a matter of, okay, now all I have to do is focus in and do what I know how to do. Dude, that's awesome. So in the finals, how long were those sets? Uh, in the finals, we do 15 minutes, 15 minutes to 18 minutes. Sets. 15 you know, to 18 yeah, that's, that's, and that's because there's only five of us. And that's the thing that really kind of separates people because some people got a dope hot five that can take first place at a, at a five minute competition and they got it. And, you know, I had good five minutes that got me second and third place throughout the prelims. Then in the semis, we go to eight to 10 minutes. And then you can see that some of those people that had the good five minutes set, that extra three minutes is going to kill them. They ain't got another three minutes. They, they brought their best five and that's it. And then you get to the finals and you realize, okay, now this is where you separate yourself as a headliner versus an open. Because 15 minutes is not just a 15 minute set. It's literally, you have to keep the people captivated for 15 straight minutes. And if you don't, you, you five minutes ain't gonna work. 10 minutes ain't gonna work. You gotta keep them going for 15 minutes straight. Which is why like on one of the shows where we had to do a TV clean set, they only made us do eight to 10 minutes because they understood doing a super clean set is a lot harder than just doing your set 15 minutes. So they gave us that grace and I took first place in that show. So it was really good. No, that's, that's awesome, man. I mean, like the fact you're able to work clean, but also like work really dirty. And it's just oh, like, yeah. do you have any advice to, for dirty comics to transition to clean comedy or how to write clean comedy when your brain is so used to just writing dirty stuff? I say evaluate your dirt. You know, like there's a difference between cussing and then dirty material and then vulgar material. You know, like I was talking to a, a, a Bay Area comedic legend, Brian Copeland, and he gave me a bit of advice on how to write clean. He said, basically, write all your jokes clean because you can always add cuss words. I can always add a fuck. I can always add a shit. I can always take the word penis and put dick in there. And I can, I can, I can. I can literally make any clean joke dirty, but it's a lot harder to make dirty jokes clean. So if you have to write, you know, if, if that's the path you want to go, because let's get this straight. If you want to be on TV, on network, television, tonight show, late show, stuff like that, working clean is good because then they can see you do clean. Uh, but if you're like, you know, me, I'm not necessarily, that's not necessarily my goal. So I don't necessarily write clean. But I can do clean if I'm asked to. Um, I have no problem with clean, but don't think you, like, if you're a dirty comic, just be the best dirty comic. Don't worry about the clean stuff. Because what I notice is if you're tremendously funny, even if you're dirty, those TV shows will find a way to work with you. Like, most people I know that have done late night TV, they have to submit the jokes they're going to do. And then the network says, okay, you can't use this joke. 
you have to take this word out of this joke. You can't say this like this. These two words can't go next to each other. You have to put something in between them. And they send you back a list of the jokes you can do, which is why on national TV, on the late night shows, you only do three to four minutes because they probably edited your shit down so much that that's all you got. <laughs> that's that's sure. as much as you can do. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I, I did my first clean show recently and it was like really challenging, like, you know, especially because like, I have a lot of like drug infused, sex infused like stories and you can't talk about any of that stuff when you're clean. You know, you just well, have here's to... what you do. Just imagine you're telling that story to your grandmother. How would you tell? Like we do it all the time as comedians. We've been doing clean comedy because like think about the times you told your parents or or your grandmother or somebody a funny story and you left out the 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 seedy parts or you left out certain words because you know instead of saying hello you said echo because you knew that you have to talk like this so just do it just put that in your mind you know like oh i'm just like talking to my grandma you know just pretending like i'm talking to my mom like i'm telling this drug story to my mom (laughs) (laughs) yep dude that's hella funny man fucking a man um um, was I gonna ask you, man? Um, I have a question about your Facebook. Um, it's really important. You keep getting banned because you talk about certain people, and I thought you were talking about YouTube. And I found out YT is white. Yes. Yeah. And so, yes. why do you get banned for using the word white on social media? Because white men run social media because you go to these tech companies it's it's a room full of various white men who don't understand the nuance of racism they think that you know like most white people go off the textbook definition of racism which was written by a white man who never dealt with racism so when you look at the textbook definition of racism it just basically says anytime you say something negative or anytime you say something about any race that isn't your own that's racism and what they leave out is the power dynamic like the ability to ban somebody for saying white. Meanwhile, I can say black, nigga, Negro, nigger. I can say all those online, but and I won't get flagged. But the minute I spell white the way it's supposed to say, I put white people together. And God forbid I say white men, then it's like, oh, you're attacking us. And their way of dealing with it is they think they're they're putting in the algorithm their feelings towards race instead of the reality of race, which is that speaking on racism means you're gonna point out white supremacy because that's the basis of racism. Like white supremacy, white supremacy is what racism is built on for everybody. And I know we say, well, black people, and, and like, in my opinion, it cannot be racist. We can be prejudiced, we can be bigoted, <laughs> but we can't be racist because we don't own the power to do something to these people. Like, I can't, like, I'm not gonna call the police on white people because I already know the police ain't coming. But they use that power against us all the time. You know, whether it's black or brown, they can do that. They can they can go into a room for Latinos and, and threaten to call INS just because they assume everybody in there is illegal. They can go into a room of black people and say, I'm gonna call the police and they assume we're all afraid of the police. Like, oh my God, you call the police. And it's like, you know, that's a power that me and you don't have in this society. You know, we don't we don't have that power. So it's it's one of those things where the algorithms are written by white men. That's what they choose to focus on. They don't want to they don't want to be called out on their own shit. Yeah, but it's just it's it's profound that the algorithm has it set out, and it's like I don't know who the hell's reporting you. Sure as fuck ain't me. I just remember that one time I got a friend request from Kai Riggins and I'm like Kai Riggins and I was like this is somebody <laughs> trying to pretend to be Riggins and then it just no, said like in your bio I was like a oh, backup account I got blocked and I was just all like yeah. is this okay is this, right legit? is this legit and I, I messaged you I was like bro I think this is you and then like you messaged me like hey I can't respond from that I, I am and I'm just like oh shit that is you yeah okay cool yeah no because that threw me off so hard because I thought somebody hacked you and I was concerned. I was just like, I couldn't believe that somebody hacked you and made this fake no, account. I was pretending to be you. And I was just like, damn. I mean, I know Riggins is cool, but Jesus Christ, who's trying to take his identity and be like, you I'm know, in him Facebook online? I'm in Facebook jail right now. 
I'm in that Facebook is, jail right now. That is so fucked up. Because I called a white man a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm a bully. I'm a bully. I'm a Facebook bully. Well, dude, you can't be calling... <laughs> You can't be calling white men bitches in public anymore, you know. Especially, no, right? yeah, happened? or at least don't transcribe it. Um, yeah, you know, say it out I'm loud. You know, it's just that's. So I can funny. say it in the IM. I'm gonna start sending messages. Bitch, <laughs> <laughs> fucking bitch. But then they'll ban you from Messenger, and then it's just like, there we go. It's like, um, yeah, I don't know. They always find a way to silence people that have something useful to say, or something empowering to say, or something is that's uplifting, or that can change society, you know, or the way that yep. people think. And it's just like, I don't know, this, the censorship. And I don't, I don't know. I, have you been affected by like cancel, not cancel culture, but like maybe you can't say like, like, do you ever, are you afraid to tell certain jokes on stage because you might get canceled? No, you don't give I'm a not, fuck. I'm not. A, I'm not. A, I mean, Hold on, hey, say, uh, this. say that again because we're we're losing we're losing service. I don't really tell a lot of jokes like that. You know, most of my jokes are. Oh, okay. I try to jokes like that really a lot. Like, I mean, I mean, on stage, like I, I try to keep my jokes in the realm of of how I actually view the world and talk. And so, I'm not going for shock value. I'm not trying to hurt people. I'm not trying to say things that make people mad. But if someone gets mad about something I say, I can say, well, that's, I, I apologize that you were offended, but I'm not changing <laughs> who I am because of your offense, because there's levels to it, you know? There is the whole, you know, get on stage and just shit on a whole group of people where it's not even funny no more, it's just a rant. And then there is that pointing out very little, pointing out things that are, that are questionable and should be talked about. And if someone gets mad about me pointing out racism, sexism, homophobia, uh, transphobia, or anything like that, then I'm, it's automatically, well, it must be you. You, you know, I don't get, I don't get offended by stuff that's true. Well, <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't get offended by stuff that's true, but some people get highly offended when you hit them with some truth, like oh, me. Me, like, Dude, yeah, you. Hey, hey, bro. I, I, I'm not gonna say who, but somebody we both know. When I first met this person, I said, "I was like, yeah, fat ass is like us," and he said, "I'm not a fat ass." And I was just like, "Do you own a fucking mirror? What the fuck do you mean you, you're not a fat ass? You're a hell of a fat ass." I mean, right. But it's just like I don't understand why the fuck you're getting exactly. offended by. I mean, it's just I think it was just he was offended because there was like women present. Like you can't say that about you know what I mean. It was just ego thing, but whatever yeah. you know. It's like, oh, and I Let guess the ladies I guess, suck your fat titties, man. Calm down. <laughs> I don't like when that happens. But um, anyway, um, what's it called? Um, how do you how do you keep your? I guess this is a question that I ask because, like, you know, it, it's it's really relevant to a lot of performers. Um, what do you do when you have a show, and you feel like really, really like depressed or like sad or exhausted, and you just. And yeah, and you got to do it. Is there any like words of encouragement or advice that you could give out to somebody that's like in that type of situation? If you don't feel it, don't do it. You know, like I try to remember that comedy is the place that I can go and get away from whatever issues I have. Like you know, that's a great thing about us. We actually have this therapeutic thing where we can go on stage and actually talk about it. And even though people are laughing, we can be hiding our pain behind that laughter and that. That, that that approval that we get from the laughter can boost our, our ego. Like, oh, okay, this problem's not too bad, you know, and you get that minute that we're free. So it can be an escape from your day to day. Um, and so I would say just feel your feels. If you feel like you can't do it, don't do it. And if you feel like you can, go do it and use it. Use that pain, use that, use that whatever's going on on stage. Because that's the great thing about what we do is we can use what hurts us to to heal us. Yeah, and yeah, that's 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 beautiful, man. Because I I, I mean, I people's like, yeah, comedy's therapeutic. Like, I mean, I've had so many people come up to me and tell me, oh, my mom just died, or I just broke up with my significant other, or whatever, or like I just found out my girl's cheating on me, or and it's just like what you did up there. I forgot about all that shit. And right. I'm just like, like, and so, like, you're doing a good job, and like, I don't know how long you've been doing this, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's just like shit, stuff like that. It's just like, oh shit, I didn't know your mom. I'm sorry to hear that. That's horrible. You know what I mean? Right. You don't know. You don't know what people are going through, and so it's just like, 
like like again with with a cancer kid and the person in the audience it's like they, they didn't know what they didn't know that those people were in the audience so it's just like i don't know if you're being edgy for the sake of being edgy that's one thing but i mean it's just like for me it's like don't talk about cancer unless you're like taking care of somebody with cancer or you yourself have or had cancer or survive you know what i mean it's like one of those things where it's just like it's super touchy you know what i mean like i i don't i don't know i feel like it's like some type of like misappropriation like in my opinion right. but right. i don't know but like i i, I really do respect everything you're you're doing i really do love your candor i really love just your genuine compassion as a human being not just as a comedian you know with all the advice and life advice and mental health advice i mean it's just like you're really multifaceted with the levels of how you care about your fellow man and the way you care about yourself. And so uh, it's been really an enlightening this podcast to actually have you on. And like, it's, it's, it's really cool. And my last question for you is where can the people find you at home? Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm what, what day is this going to come out on Tuesday? It's going to come out um, Tuesday. Well, I'm, I guess I could, I'll announce it here. I will. I will make the announcement here. Uh, the uh, you have two more opportunities to see me here in the Bay Area before I move to LA um, in January. Uh, I will what? be at the Alameda Comedy Club December. Yeah, I'm. I'm leaving again. Uh, I'll be at the Alameda Comedy Club December 16th and 17th for four shows, uh, two nights. Uh, that's going to be dope. Tickets are available at AlamedaComedyClub.com or on my link tree and my uh, IG bio, Chris Riggins Comedy. Um, and then I will be hosting uh, Cobbs all the way up into New Year's Eve, actually for New Year's Eve, uh, uh, coming up at the end of December. So Alameda Comedy Club and Cobbs Comedy Club, the last two real chances you're going to get to see me here in the Bay Area. Uh, January 2nd, I start my new job as a door guy at the Comedy Store, the world-famous Comedy Store in Los Angeles. So I will be oh, in shit. Los Angeles. Okay, so, so after that, you got to come to the comedy store to see me, dude. That is amazing. That is, fun. dude. Congratulations, man! Like, I really like. Um, I'm looking forward to that. You know, seeing you because I know how hard you grind. I'm gonna see you somewhere, and yeah. so and dude, that's so awesome, man! Like that, that's great. And um, I'll just put in the in the bio description. Uh, Chris makes a great announcement. I won't say exactly what. It is. <laughs> you know, so you gotta stay tuned and Big watch, announcements. But, Big announcement. Yes. It's like that's the Watch clip. At the end, to the that's end. the that's the clip. You know, it's just like <laughs> but no, um, yeah, man. Um I'm gonna put all of that. I'm gonna put your your link tree and your and um all your social medias uh so people can follow you, go to your shows. Uh be sure to follow Chris. He's hysterical on stage, uh off stage. He's a he's a gentleman. And it's it's really, really great to be in the presence of somebody who's so caring and um without even saying without even being my personal mentor you're offered mentorship with you know all of the great advice that you're giving out and it's just it's awesome for people like you to give back to other comics with such great advice so i want to thank you so much chris riggins for your time i want to thank, thank you, you so much for your generosity and um i can't wait for you to move to la bro i'm in santa monica dude i'm just down the street 20 minutes away or, or if there's traffic an hour and a half. It just an depends. hour and a half, right? It, it, it just depends, bro. Like, I'm serious. It took me one point. It took me 35 minutes to get 1.9 miles. I was like, this has to be wrong. This That's has why I quit to be Lyft wrong. There. That's bro. why I don't drive Lyft there because it was oh. like, oh my god. Yeah, yeah. You got it. Different side hustles. It's just something else. Yeah, not, driving is not the business in LA. And it's just like, exactly. it's like I had to leave four hours early to get to this show in San Diego because I wasn't sure. And thank God I did. I got there. 10 minutes before i was supposed to be there and thank god wow. i found park yeah so it was just like yeah you never know like and then going into la you know yeah. whether you're going downtown or you're going to hollywood which is totally two different areas and so yeah. i thought it was the same shit before i moved here and i'm just like nope nope comedy store is not downtown la that's in hollywood you dumb fuck nope. anyway yep. but um yeah. <laughs> anyway yeah so i'm gonna put all that info there thank you chris i love you man i wish you continued success you, and you, um i can't wait to see you down here in la be sure to check out chris riggins be sure to follow him and uh thank you so much for listening to poppycock podcast we hope to catch you next time thanks a lot for listening and stay cool Thanks for listening. Subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, do your boy a favor. 
Tell your friends, tell your cool family members, tell your cool co-workers, let them know about the podcast and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and be sure to follow me on all social media, Puro Papi Pacheco, and check out my website at hispanictitanic.com for future dates. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you on the next one. Have a great day.